So, so people understand. So the, the currently the king of Saudi Arabia is his father, uh, but it's my understanding that it was actually supposed to be one of his cousins who was in line to be the next king until several months ago, uh, and then he was put into place. What happened there? Yeah, this is a, a very uh, um, kind of violent family struggle, uh, not violent in the sense of use of force, but in the sense of very strong resentments among different wings of the family, because uh, when the founder of Saudi Arabia, uh, King Abdulaziz, died in 1953, his uh, power was passed to his sons. He had 45 sons, uh, and the, um, the last of them uh, is currently King Salman, who was now chosen to pass power o on to his son rather to than to one of his very uh, old and increasingly feeble brothers. Uh, so the, the power now is leaping a generation to the grandsons of King Abdulaziz, uh, and that's what has made it very critical uh, period in the, in the kingdom's uh, history. When they, you talk about this anti-corruption committee, which I understand this crown prince is overseeing, basically, what kind of corruption are we talking about? I mean, everyone out there knows how rich the country of Saudi Arabia is, uh, the family members there. I mean, one of the people, my understanding, who was arrested is one of the richest people in the world, they, they, they say. Um, what kind of corruption are we talking about? Well, uh, historically, it's the division between the coffers of the government and the private pocketbooks of the family have been it's been kind of murky the, the boundary there and many uh, princes uh, that have led ministries have used uh, their power to uh, siphon off money either in tr bribes or kickbacks uh, and that has increased uh, the price of doing business in Saudi Arabia but is line uh, the the pockets of many princes and their patronage networks. The, the many people have probably heard uh, a couple. Well, maybe it was a month or two months ago that uh, it was this crown prince who came out and said we're going to now allow women to drive in Saudi Arabia, which had been banned for for years. Uh, he also seems to be playing to maybe a younger audience. I mean, I think the majority of Saudi Arabians are under the age of, of 30. Uh, is that, do you think, some of what's going on here is he's trying to establish uh, his, you know, basically win the favor of, of the growing larger uh, public there? Yeah, I think one thing that makes him puzzling is although he's ruthless and he's moving very quickly, he also uh, – uh, has a reputation as a reformer, and he's supported not only greater rights for women, including driving, but he wants to encourage women's uh, participation in the labor force in order to uh, boost the Saudi economy. He's also called for a return to a mo more moderate form of Islam, uh, it, and he's liberalized uh, rules on entertainment, on sports, uh, allowed more movies, there's less censorship, uh, more mixing of the sexes, uh, which is resisted by some of the uh, hardcore fundamentalist uh, religious leaders in Saudi Arabia. So he's also moved against some of them uh, in addition to this anti-corruption drive. So on, on the one hand, he's putting rivals uh, in jail or at least under house arrest and doing it very ruthlessly. But on the other hand, uh, he is... Uh, trying to uh, put in motion some long overdue uh, economic and social reforms that could bring uh, Saudi Arabia out of the Middle Ages. Well, yeah, one of the articles I read said that he's trying to make it a country that is not so dependent on oil, uh, though that's certainly a big factor there, but trying to expand it to tourism and education, a host of other things. Right. He's the architect of the uh, Saudi Vision 2030, which is a very ambitious economic plan to diversify the Saudi economy, move it away from its dependence on oil export revenues, uh, privatize the state-owned oil company, uh, Saudi Aramco, uh, and that's expected to come next year, which could be uh, many tens of billions of dollars that uh, the Saudis will invest in, in broadening and liberalizing their economy. So earlier, I mean, very early on in President Trump's presidency, he made a visit uh, with, with the Saudi Arabia and said, you know, they're going to be our partners in fighting uh, terrorism and the like. 
what does this do to all of that? I mean, what what is the relationship with the with between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, and how does what's going on there now af- affect that? Well, uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, is is also known to be very close to Jared Kushner. Uh, I think there, it's been uh, portrayed as an alliance of the the House of Saud and the, the House of Trump. Uh, although it's important to note there also was a previous alliance uh, alliance for the House of Saud and the House of Bush. Uh, so th- in, in the way the Saudis think, they prefer to, to deal with families, uh, and uh, they, d- they uh, put a very high premium on personal relations, in part because they don't trust institutions. And so uh, it's interesting to note that Jared Kushner uh, wi- traveled to Saudi Arabia I think about 10 days ago, uh, just before this most recent round of uh, anti-corruption purges. So uh, there may be some uh, uh, close alliances there. What should the response of the United States be to what's happened? I mean, do we? it's another country. They're, they're a sovereign country. Uh, how, how do we react to what's happened? Well, I think it's an internal m- matter, and as long as it's conducted according to the rule of law, there's not a lot uh, that w- we should be saying about it, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, to the extent that it uh, results in uh, a Saudi Arabia that practices a more tolerant form of Islam, uh, that presents uh, less uh, ideological fodder for Islamist extremist groups such as ISIS or Al-Qaeda, I think that's a good thing. And the Crown Prince uh, has publicly declared that he's in favor of that, and he's a very strong opponent of these Islamic ex- extremists. So I think I- on balance, uh, it's a good thing, uh, but it's a little surprising uh, the speed and the scope of change, uh, because that uh, has not been uh, historically the norm in Saudi Arabia. What does this mean? I'm thinking of you see my little red hat down here. I went to uh, Israel uh, back earlier this fall, and they gave me uh, the Build Israel Great Again hat. W- what does this mean for Saudi Arabia's neighbors in the Middle East, not just Israel, but all of the all of the neighbors? They have to be looking at this very carefully, and, uh, and Iran, for sure. Uh, well, Iran uh, is, is feeling uh, threatened by these moves, in part because... Uh, they know that this uh, young crown prince uh, uh, is very anti-Iranian, uh, and one of the ways he'll probably try to appease the Wahhabi religious uh, establishment is to t- take a more anti-Shiite bent, uh, not only against Iran, but against Hezbollah and uh, the Houthi rebels in Yemen that the Saudis are fighting now, who also are Shiites aligned with Iran. Uh, so from Ira- Iran's point of view, it's a reason for concern, but for uh, from Israel's standpoint and from the standpoint of uh, most other Sunni Arab Middle Eastern states, I think they see the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman as a potential counterweight to Iran, and as a reformer, uh, they probably hope that he will... Uh, uh, further uh, reduce uh, the power of Wahhabi uh, Islamic uh, religious uh, leaders because they uh, have historically uh, promoted a brand of Islam that has destabilized many other countries. Jim, thank you very much for shedding light on this issue that's an uh, interesting one, one that we'll continue to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the Heritage Foundation's Facebook Live. We'll see you back here next time.